Really quick, as if you're like me and you sometimes have a difficult time trying to fall asleep at night, you should try one of Mantis Sleep Masks through the link down below. I recommend the regular Mantis Sleep Mask as it's comfortable as ever and it blocks out 100% of the light in the room that you're in. The cooling mask isn't too bad either. Make sure to use promo code CHRISH at checkout to complete your order, and I do receive a small commission from each purchase through the link below. Well, the Port Huron, Michigan area is often referred to by locals as the Blue Water Area, as the water from Lake Huron is a nice shade of blue. The St. Clair River starts here as it heads south to Lake St. Clair, and Port Huron sits right across the river from Sarnia, Ontario, in which both cities are connected by the almighty Blue Water Bridge. Don't get me started on the Canadian Border Patrol officers. That's a different story. Anyway, when you combine the population of both the Michigan and Ontario sides of the river in this region, this becomes a populated area of about 150,000 or so. And now, it's time to start checking out the city. After looking for dolphins for a good three hours that morning and not finding any on the massive freshwater lake, I grew salty and left. No, no, not funny, nobody, oh, okay. Well, um, well, all right. Well, I start the video on the north side of town and it's the nicer part of town. The highlight of it is all of the nice homes that can be found off of the shores of Lake Huron, or as my friend likes to call it, Lake Huron. No, no, nobody? Oh, okay, well, uh, I guess I'll just try to stop being funny, but outside of the Saginaw Bay further north, Lake Huron is a really nice lake overall, and it has some really nice spots that are underrated, as Lake Michigan is the more popular lake to visit for all of the tourists that visit Michigan. At the time of me making this video, there aren't too many homes for sale off of Lake Huron in Port Huron or Fort Gratiot Township, which is just north of the city, but it looks like the ones that are for sale are in the upper six-figure range, and there's one that's over a million. There's another one that's under 400,000, but I'm guessing that that one isn't directly off of Lake Huron, and it has maybe some lake access that you can get to as you cross a road, but you don't get lake views from the house if it's that low of a price. But these prices don't rival the ones that you'll see off of Lake Michigan as you can't find a house off of Lake Michigan for under a million bucks. Anyway, the south side of town doesn't match what you see here and we'll get there later in the video. These days, Port Huron is home to only 28,000 people, which is down from a peak population of 36,000. Sometimes the numbers for a primary city of a region don't necessarily tell the whole story of the region that they're in, and that's the case with Port Huron. As you can see here, the city has lost nearly 10,000 residents since a 1960 peak of 36,000, while St. Clair County didn't start to see a population decline until 2010, and it's only lost 4,000 people altogether since the 2000 census count. With the way that things have been going in Michigan, you can probably expect the population to continue to decline in the coming census counts. Also, believe it or not, St. Clair County is technically a part of the Metro Detroit area. Port Huron is about an hour drive northeast from downtown Detroit, while it's about a half hour drive before you reach some of Detroit's core suburbs. Anyway, despite the area of town that you see here, in Port Huron, the median household income is a low $41,000 per year, compared to $58,000 for the county. 17% of adults 25 and older hold a bachelor's degree or higher, and the median value of owner-occupied housing units is only $97,000. To cap things off for Port Huron, the poverty rate is more than double the national average, as 23% of Port Huron residents are living in poverty. That's a rate of nearly one out of every four. However, you can see the numbers for the county right next to the stats for Port Huron, and you can see that things are not as bad here as the numbers for Port Huron might suggest. Music 
This is Port Huron Northern High School, one of two high schools in the Port Huron Area School District. The athletic teams go by the Huskies, and Niche.com rates the public school as a B, so that's not bad. When it comes to the crime rates, Port Huron is double the national average rate when it comes to violent crime, while the property crime rate is also higher than average. You residents in Port Huron need to stop getting into bar fights at your local pubs and stop breaking into your neighbor's cars. No, seriously, stop, because those are not good things. Yeah, your boy needs a haircut, I know, but I have one scheduled, so we're all good there. But anyway, the public schools for Port Huron don't necessarily reflect the one that we just saw in Port Huron Northern High School, as the school district altogether gets a C-plus ranking on Niche.com. Could be better. Currently, we're still heading north along Port Huron's Gratiot Avenue, which parallels the Lake Huron shoreline, and soon the road will turn into Lakeshore Drive, as it will then completely enter Fort Gratiot Charter Township. More on townships in a minute, as you can think of Fort Gratiot as a suburb of Port Huron. The median household income is $70,000 per year, 26% of adults 25 and older have a bachelor's degree or higher, and the median value of owner-occupied housing units is $172,000, while the poverty rate is 9%. Basically, it goes without saying that if, for whatever reason, you're looking to move to the Port Huron area, the north side of town, or even Fort Gratiot Township, is definitely the place to be if you can afford it. And now we're completely within Fort Gratiot Charter Township. While Port Huron is like all other primary Michigan cities in which the city limits were never able to expand much, as these primary cities are all surrounded by charter townships, Port Huron especially. When Michigan was founded early on, it was settled by a lot of people that came over from New York, a state that also applies a similar strategy. It's kind of ironic as early on in my life, my family moved to Michigan from upstate New York. What a coincidence. Well, anyway, in Michigan, you have cities, villages, and townships, where townships cover about 96% of the land area in Michigan. When it comes to townships, you have regular townships and charter townships. You'll almost always find that charter townships surround the cities, as in 1947, Michigan created charter townships as a form of municipality to give townships more power over their communities. And over time, it became a popular way to make it nearly impossible for these primary cities to annex their land. So simply put, in Michigan, it's much more difficult for a city to annex the surrounding land as an area sees suburban-like growth, and over the years, that has made many of Michigan cities look worse than they actually are when it comes to the crime and economic stats. For example, Port Huron might have only 28,000 people, but the area more so resembles that of a city that has 60,000 people than 30,000, as when you add up the population counts for the nearby townships and the city of Marysville to the south, it all adds up to be about 60,000, so in most states, Port Huron would be a city that's home to 50,000 rather than just 28. With that all said and done, this is one of the main retail shopping areas in the region, as you can see, and it's all within Fort Gratiot Charter Township, not in Port Huron. But yes, plenty of places for the local hilljacks to get their Mountain Dew and cheap flannel shirts. And don't forget that sunscreen for when you take your boat out on the water. No shade out there. Man, if I ever get a flat tire on the road, this is where I want to be. You got like five tire shops here. Well anyway, this is the Birchwood Mall, and just like malls in every other city that's the size of Port Huron, this mall is slowly dying away in today's age of online shopping. It's still open for business, but time seems to be ticking on how much longer the mall can stay open, as retail chains nationwide continue to close their stores that serve the smaller markets while keeping most of their stores in the bigger cities and metro areas. The Birchwood Mall is actually a lot younger than I would have thought, as it opened in 1991. 
Most indoor shopping malls like this were developed in either the 70s or 80s. Anyway, Birchwood has only one of its original anchor stores left as the three others closed up shop and they've been unused in the mall for nearly a decade now. And you know when you're in a big open parking lot in the state of Michigan when you see a ton of seagulls. And now we're back on the main road and we're heading south into town. Well, now let's talk about the history of Port Huron. This area was first settled all the way back in 1686 and was called Fort St. Joseph by then French explorer Daniel Graysolen Duluth. Same guy who found the larger city in Duluth, Minnesota, which is about 500 miles northwest. Anyway, the fort was burned a few years later as the tribe that originally settled in the area then moved further north to Fort Michelin Mackinac, where Mackinac City sits today. In 1814, Fort Gratiot was established at the spot where the St. Clair River begins, which is basically the same spot that I started the video at, and that is what's considered to be the first organized population of the area that we know today as Port Huron. Here's a rule of thumb as we continue to travel the country and learn about all of these cities. You can basically expect a city to be rich in history if it's along a major waterway. Well, anyway, here's an interesting fact, as with Port Huron being in a state that often brags about its abundance of lighthouses in their pure Michigan tourist ads, the state's very first lighthouse was built here in Port Huron in 1825, and that is the Fort Gratiot Lighthouse. The one that stands today is actually the second one, as the original one was poorly constructed and it fell apart during a bad storm. It was also only the second one to be built along the shoreline of the Great Lakes. Today, like many of Michigan's lighthouses, you can pay $10 to go inside and climb to the top if you wish. In 1827, a legislative act called for the making of townships across the state, and for an unknown reason, Port Huron was first called Desmond. The other main township that Port Huron sat in was called Sinclair, but the name changed to Port Huron in 1837, and in 1849, Port Huron was incorporated as a village, and in 1857, Port Huron gained city status. Port Huron was home to Michigan's first steam-powered sawmill, but most notably, Thomas Edison is from here. Edison's family moved to Port Huron in 1854 from Ohio because, obviously, Michigan is better than Ohio at everything. Edison is documented to have worked on the railroad selling the town's newspapers as a teenager, as he dropped out of school at the age of 12. As Edison grew older, he traveled the country working in the new technology then called telegraphy. It wasn't until 1875 when he and his father were able to set up a laboratory in Menlo Park, New Jersey. It was there that Edison was able to build upon others' inventions and make them more practical, such as the light bulb, the phonograph, and some of the first cameras for motion pictures, along with the carbon microphone that was eventually used on telephones. But nonetheless, this is where Thomas Edison grew up, and he has a street along the St. Clair River named after him, which we'll see later. Outside of that, Port Huron thrived on the oil and gas industry, along with shipbuilding. 
There were two major fires that occurred in the city early on, one in 1871 that killed 200 people and another in 1881 that was known as the Thumb Fire, as it burned much of the land in Michigan's Thumb region, which in return had a negative effect on the shipbuilding industry as much of the lumber was supplied through the nearby forests. Currently, we're underneath the Blue Water Bridge, which carries I-69 and I-94 into Canada. The next bridge to the north to connect Canada with the United States is all the way in Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, which is about four and a half hours north of here. And the next bridge south is the Ambassador Bridge in Detroit. Well, anyway, more history as in 1886, Michigan's first electric railway and the third in the nation was built from Port Huron to Detroit. And around the same time, petroleum production began in Port Huron, as the area had as many as 22 wells that were drilled. So you can now start to see that Port Huron had several industries early on that helped it grow. Port Huron never really relied on the auto industry like Detroit did or other cities did in Michigan, such as Lansing or Jackson. Port Huron more so relied on oil and gas, along with shipbuilding. And now we're on the almighty Thomas Edison Parkway, which offers nice views of the St. Clair River and Sarnia, Ontario. Well, Port Huron was also a large immigration point with its location to Canada and with Toronto not being that far away among other major Canadian cities, as Ontario by far and away has the most population of any Canadian province. In fact, the city's website claims that Port Huron was the second largest immigration point in the U.S. after only New York City. That's kind of hard to believe, with the much larger city of Detroit being not that much further south, and with it also bordering Canada, not to mention San Francisco being a major immigration hub. But. That's what the city's website says. Another interesting fact is that the first underriver train tunnel opened between Port Huron and Sarnia back in 1891, and it's still used today. Although Port Huron grew to be a decently populated area over time, and it still is today, growth stopped around the 1950s and the population of the area has remained the same ever since. Sure, the city has seen almost 10,000 people leave since its peak years, but as I talked about earlier, when you add in the population from the nearby townships, the population of the area has basically stayed the same. And that's the history rundown of Port Huron, Michigan. To the left is the Huron Lightship Museum. It was the last operating lightship in the state of Michigan when it stopped being used in 1970. This ship wasn't always here, as it was anchored in a shallow, sandy area six miles north of Port Huron. Obviously, it's been moved to its current location for display. A lightship is basically a floating lighthouse, and they were common back in the day to be used in areas that were impractical to build a lighthouse. In 1990, the Huron Lightship was designated as a National Historic Landmark. Today, you can pay $10 to go inside and take a look. While on the subject of ships, Port Huron takes part in an annual boat race that's been taking place since 1925 called the Bayview Mackinac Race. Over 200 boats participate each year as they take off along the Black River and then go against the current in the St. Clair River and up to Mackinac Island, which can take participants anywhere from two to three days to complete. To the left is the Ladies of Maccabees building, which is a historic landmark. The Ladies of the Maccabees was a woman's benefit association in the late 1800s and throughout the 1900s.
And now we're about to head down the main street in Port Huron, which is called Huron Avenue. To the right is McMorran Place, which has an arena that's home to the Port Huron Prowlers of the Federal Prospects Hockey League. Several other minor league hockey teams have played here over the years. The arena also holds area concerts and can seat up to 4,800. The complex also includes a theater that can seat up to 1,157, and it's home to the Port Huron Civic Theater. And two blocks away from the main street heading east towards the river, there's not really much interesting going on over here. You just have a bunch of city-owned buildings that serve different types of government functions. And here it looks like you have some new luxury condos. And here it looks like we have more buildings off of this street that serve government functions. You have the courthouse and the library off to the left with other office buildings on the right.
the left, you have St. Clair Community College, home to the Skippers. Among the most notable alumni is Rob Thompson, who is currently serving as the interim manager for the Philadelphia Phillies. And to the right, you have Port Huron's McLaren Hospital, which serves as one of the organization's 14 hospitals in southeastern Michigan. In fact, McLaren leads St. Clair County in employment, as it employs almost 1,400. In second place, it's the automotive tech company Motherson that employs 1,000. Coming in third, it's auto body parts supplier ZF Marysville employing 920. And then it's Lake Huron Medical Center in fourth place employing 500. And in fifth place, it's a plastic company called US Ferrothane employing 400. Currently crossing the Black River, which is the other river in Port Huron. Why does it got to be called the Black River? <laughs> I don't know. I don't think it's called that for any negative reason. It's just called the Black River. Now, black ice, you definitely got a point there because black ice is not technically black ice. It's clear ice and black ice. There's nothing good about it. It causes nasty injuries. It causes nasty car accidents. So I can see that one. And we all know being in Michigan that Port Huron sees plenty of that. Up ahead on the right, the fancy looking building with the dome is actually the Port Huron Port of Entry, or where the US Customs and Border Protection is located. Well, we're now on the south side of town, which is the less glamorous side of Port Huron as far as wealth and the quality of life is concerned. One of the leading contributors to Port Huron's high crime rates is illegal drug usage. It might be safe to assume that nearly all of the crime in Port Huron is associated with that, as Port Huron's drug task force works overtime these days, nearly every week trying to get the problem solved. The task force performs multiple drug raids a day, with meth being a huge issue here. A WXYZ Detroit article says that in 48 hours, the drug task force raided four homes earlier in the spring of 2022, with having a total of eight raids in two weeks. Yet, the problem still continues to be large here in Port Huron, specifically on the southern part of town. The number of drug overdose deaths in St. Clair County are continuing to rise, unfortunately, and recently the St. Clair County Community Mental Health Center has hired 100 new employees to help support the rising number of people that are retrieving services from the facility, most of them being drug addicts. More on drugs in a minute, as directly across the St. Clair River from the south side of Port Huron is an area in Canada that's known as Chemical Valley. It's a 15-mile stretch of chemical industrial facilities that line the St. Clair River in Canada, and it sits right across the southern part of Port Huron and some other communities like Marysville to the south. At least the wind blows all of the pollution away from Michigan and into Canada, but it's definitely not a pretty sight. 
Reports say that over 700 chemical spills were made into the St. Clair River from Chemical Valley companies between 1986 and the year 2000. The city of Sarnia also has the worst air quality by far and away out of any city in Canada because of Chemical Valley. The chemical pollutants that are released into the air and the water include several that are known to cause cancer. And in 2005, there were over 12.5 million pounds of toxic air pollutants released from these facilities into the Canadian air. And I know that 2005 was ages ago, but that's the reality of Chemical Valley. That number was higher than the number of toxic pollutants released into the air by the entire Canadian provinces of Manitoba, New Brunswick, and Saskatchewan. At one point in 1985, Dow Chemical Canada spilled more than 2,900 gallons of perchlorothiazide, whatever, I'll spell it below, but um, that's a dry cleaning solvent, however you pronounce that. And that spill left a giant tar-like blob at the bottom of the St. Clair River for years. Perchloroethylene. That's how you say it. Perchloroethylene. Back to the topic of drug usage, the state of Michigan is actually one of the worst states in this category as the opioid epidemic has hit the mitten hard. A survey from 2020 showed that in Michigan, nearly 10% of the state's adult residents had some form of addiction, with alcohol being the highest at 5% of the state's population. The rest is made up with illegal drug usage, such as heroin, meth, and cocaine. And in Michigan, the death rate for drug overdose deaths has surpassed that of car crash fatalities as there are over five overdose deaths on average daily throughout the entire state. Unfortunately, Port Huron is just one of several Michigan communities that have an extremely high rate of drug usage. And for the rest of this video, we'll be driving through and checking out some of the other residential areas of the city that we haven't yet been to, and we'll cross by the other high school. Earlier in the video, we saw Port Huron Northern High School. Well, this is the other high school in the area, as to the right is Port Huron High School, home to the Big Reds. Hey, I find that offensive, Port Huron. You better get that name changed or I'll get the whole cancel culture on you. 
but nobody cares about us redheads, so you're probably safe. The school was founded in 1868, and Niche.com ranks the school as a B-. All in all, Port Huron isn't the worst place that you could live. It has some nice areas on the north side of town, and as you saw, if you like water recreation, Port Huron has plenty of that for you. Granted, the weather is only nice for six months out of the year, and it lacks in some big city amenities that you could find further south in the metro Detroit area. The population of the area, though, has been declining, and we'll just have to wait and see what the future holds for Port Huron, Michigan. With that said, I do end the video here. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to drop a like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't already, as doing all of those things helps these videos destroy the evil monster that is the YouTube algorithm. Also make sure to hit that notification bell and select yes so that you can be notified every time that I upload a new video. If you enjoyed this video, then you might enjoy checking out some of the featured playlists on this channel. Videos with amazing insights on other places like what you saw here can be found in my Michigan playlist, my USA Small Cities playlist, or in my Great Lakes playlist. Last but not least, if you can't get enough of me on here, you can always go follow me on my other social media accounts, and those links are below. We'll see you next time. Peace.